Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Very warm welcome to our next lecture of the NCCR and of uh, our MAS uh, lecture series. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Nada Tarani uh, tonight. And when you know that you have to announce and introduce someone in the evening, you always scan any word and you listen very carefully uh, what the guest says during the day. So we had Nader as a guest critic uh, for our Labyrinth project. It was a great pleasure and intellectual pleasure um, to see him discuss the project with us. Uh, at one point he spoke of the resolution of ideas and I thought this is, fits very well um, what was what our intention was uh, in regard to Nader's invitation to give a lecture here, because as researchers and also as students in the MAS, we tend to focus and we go very deep and we code or we just draw. But then architecture, of course, is also a, a rather, not just historically, but still today, a rather complex discipline and practice, and it encompass, encompasses really the idea that you draw and the idea that you communicate and the building that you try to negotiate with contractors. It involves the legal dimensions, all the complexities that you are facing when you go out there. At the same time, questions of what innovates architecture and what pushes architecture into the future um, are important as well. And we think, and I'm very convinced, that Nader is actually one of the few architects who can bridge all these different dimensions and also negotiate these dimensions. And because of that, manages to turn ideas into built projects. Nader is the dean of the Cooper Union School of Architecture used to be the head of the architecture department at MIT, and as the principal of NADA, a firm that is doing rather large buildings nowadays. Surely he will present a few of them. Um, NADA was established in 2011, but I think already after your uh, bachelor, uh, you started uh, office da yeah. um, in 1986. So there's a long journey from the bachelor all the way to today. So it's my great pleasure to have having you here and to hear the lecture. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation. And it's been a, a real pleasure to be part of the reviews with you also. And um, many of the questions that I asked are, uh, are very much connected to uh, the problems that we have been trying to address uh, over the years. Uh, the, the question of representation, of course, has so many connotations. Uh, in pictorial ways, uh, what, what has to do with the representation of reality or through mimesis, what has to do with um, how reality is described, for instance, through geometry, descriptive geometry, or in other terms, how new tools suggest a certain instrumentality uh, about how we depict that reality. I'm always reminded of the way in which Greg Lynn describes the, 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 the capacity of the architect to go from a line to a spline and how that unleashes a whole new uh, possibility in architecture. Uh, the one that uh, we weren't ready for was, of course, code and scripting because this is one of those instances where a non-visual language has a fundamental and disruptive potential to unleash a whole new poten potential that has a dialogue with visu visuality in, in the pictorial realm, but in fact, the language is, uh, is no longer visual. So it's non-compositional. And so it's a, it has been a very difficult transition for uh, a great bunch of those people in my generation to contend with. 
Uh, I say this with great vulnerability because you have to imagine that when I graduated, there wasn't a computer. And the computer came the year after. So uh, I have been essentially students of that generation, then that generation, then that generation uh, in sequence, uh, and almost never being able to catch up. But one of the things that we did very early in our practice, uh, particularly because we were in America, where we were aliens to that culture, where we didn't have clients or any uh, distinct access to commissions, was to invent projects. And in that context, inventing projects was installations or uh, developing uh, a reign over means and methods uh, of fabrication that would normally be relegated to the contractor. And I'll speak to this a little bit further later on. But it's important that this was research was an avenue towards uh, access to architecture. In those early years, we did these projects uh, and uh, submitting for Progressive Architecture Awards, which gained us two uh, prizes that led one day to a call from uh, uh, Terry Riley, who was then the curator of MoMA, to do an installation at MoMA called Fabrications. Naturally, we knew it was a fake call, so we hung up on him until he called back, uh, very angry, to say, you know, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, the theme was fabrications. In the context of, you know, 1996, that was actually quite innovative at the time because architects drew, architects didn't build. He said, I want you to, I don't want any drawings, I don't want any models, I want a fragment of architecture that speaks the language of construction. It has to be right, it has to be true, it has to be level, and it has to have command over tolerances. Well, uh, this is right, uh, this is true, this is level, and the tolerances come in the notation of less than half an inch. What we wanted to do is to develop a flat canvas out in the garden of MoMA that had the capacity of absolute abstraction. Uh, I don't remember how many it is, but it's five bays times X bays. Let's say 45 panels of flat panels which are totally matte, essentially speaking to the paintings and the abstraction of modern art. Of course, you and I know that that is the last thing we wanted to do. In reality, what we were invested in was working with a steel technology that was not germane to the industry. No I-beams, no angles, uh, no angles, but working with essentially folded plate technology using laser cutters at that time, which was quite innovative, scoring them in an offset pattern to create what is called a stitched seam. Uh, almost as if you were suturing it, suturing it together. But that, what that produces is the continuity of steel uh, around the fold to produce structural legibility and continuity. Of course, what we were really interested in was to produce a bleacher stair that was non-standard. So, uh, no two panels, obviously, are uh, the same. And because this is conceived as an anamorphic ruse, it is only from one perspective that you see it as true, as right, and as level. Uh, but that is also the gauge of how you know it's been built correctly with a half an inch of tolerance. Uh, this entire thing um, is folded to give it that structural rigidity, but also to give it that kind of effectiveness over construction means. The two projects that led to that project um, were the Western House and Casa La Roca, which I will present. Western House uh, is this project that was an addition to a one-story building. We added another story, and we wanted a skin that would conceal the seam between the first and the second floor. But that was not enough. We wanted a flat sheathing that would produce spatiality. It was not a skin. It was actually an awning. It was a space. It was a threshold. Understanding that corrugated copper uh, 
has the capacity to be structurally rigid on the vertical axis, but completely malleable on the horizontal, it means that by unruling it, you could create a space within which you insert the stair connecting the living room to the floor. But in the act of doing that, we discovered something about drawing. Because the length of the top of the line is exactly the length of the bottom, it demonstrates a geometric theorem that is directly related to the act of construction. In architecture, drawing is not a pictorial act. It is always already an act of construction. So you don't actually need to build something to know that this is buildable just by virtue of knowing that that line and that line are exactly the same length. So the principle of the developable surface uh, or the ruled surface uh, is essentially embedded or inscribed in a corrugated surface. And as you know, corrugation produces the vectors, the lines, that is what a ruled surface is. It's not a compound curvature. It is actually built up of uh, single lines. Embedded behind uh, our interest is this tension between figuration and configuration, which are, I think, two sides of the same coin. Uh, the bowl, the cast bowl, if you like, is actually the, uh, identical to the nest. A cast is composed of aggregates, if you like, of cement, uh, of admixture. And when it's polished, it erases the marks of construction. But the reality is that it is made up of molecular, uh, a molecular field. The nest is articulate about its molecular field. A bird takes one straw at a time, one blade of gr grass at a time, and aggregates them with the possibility of becoming the nest. What is interesting about the bird, of course, is that it's a generative process. So that blade could have produced many other possible figures, not just the bowl. And the majority of our research has been delegated to the right-hand side of that diagram because we don't see the detail as the end result of architecture, but rather the formative seed. To that end, when we look at uh, the work of Leverance, interestingly, in, interestingly enough, we are actually not looking at the brick. We're looking at the space between, and then that's the mortar. The, re the research that you've done today is a seminal piece of research, but I stumbled on that research uh, at a similar moment in my career as you. I realized that the field of mortar in Leverance's work is bigger than the brick itself. And that means that the bonding system could be completely different. For Casa La Roca, when we went to uh, uh, Caracas, uh, this is the sketch I did on site. There was a huge rock in the backyard, massive, meaning it's about the height of this hall, about 20, 30 feet, making it impossible to put a house there. So we did an L courtyard, uh, and there's a very close-by neighbor here with a, a wall here that frames the courtyard with an axial view of the rock. That's the rock in section. And this sketch, which is essentially a folded plane, much like the staircase, is meant to essentially, through folding, give structural or lateral stability uh, to that wall. Not unfamiliar to you. You radiused it, we folded it. But we went straight to the detail to figure out how that works. And we're distinctly aware of the fact that operations of aggregation on the right uh, formulate brick as matter, whereas the figuration imposed it on, on, on the left is a kind of design impulse that's overlaid on it. And what we were insistent on, much like Leverance, was to produce figure through matter and through the operations that are intrinsic to the brick itself. And to that end, it's the mortar line. Uh, what did you call your bonding system? The what? Or the... Yeah, exactly. Uh, what we were looking at was the running bond versus the Flemish bond. The way that we had interpreted the Flemish bond is not this as a brick, but that as mortar. In other words, as an extension of the field of the mortar, 
What happens when you eliminate that? That's really sitting on that, and that's a void. Now, what's the function, of course, of the Flemish bond? Is that's a dead man, and a dead man gives depth to the retaining wall, which is why this works the way, the, the way that it does. And it gives depth to that wall. What I'm going to be showing here is the transition also of our education. So please excuse me for having drawn this in pencil. That is how we drew. Um, we realized that if you imagine that the mortar line is variable, you're inventing something that's called the variable bond. It's not a running bond. It's not the Flemish bond. It's a notation. And that index can be whatever it needs to be between X and Y, as long as there's enough overlap for its stability. No brick is cut on the diagonal because the fold happens on the diagonal, no matter what the dimension of a bay. And the only time you cut a brick is on the seam. And when you look at this detail, recall for a second what Utsun had to do in Sydney. Is that the moment that the tiles come to an end, they have to recalibrate and go back and zigzag uh, again. Uh, we didn't know Utsun at the time. And we knew Utsun, but we didn't know the tile detail. Uh, so I only discovered that some 20 years later and was completely uh, fascinated by it because we are so um, accustomed to reading Sydney as a figure, as a sculpture. We, we don't know its construction until we go there. So for me, it was a great discovery. But the essential logic of this Casa de Roca is how to take a load-bearing wall and then free it up so that the structural agency of the folding is combined with the prospect of bringing light and air through a diaphanous surface. I'm sorry, I'm speaking to the, uh, to the converted, but um, these are all things you've done, and you've done better, and this is pre-robotic. So um, this is the next generation of representation that we undertook. So this is reverse education. I'm now, this is five or six years later, learning on the computer how to draw this out, uh, combining it with uh, the model that we'd built by hand, of course, with jigs, and uh, drawing through the vectors of the fold. Uh, the funny story about this, of course, is that we'd made them with jigs, but we left the office the day before we were supposed to fold them together. There was a lot of humidity. So each panel had different amounts of glue in it. So they had grown and shrunk in different levels. So we, we had to go back in there and, and sand all of those little pieces of wood to, to bring them back into alignment. And this is my latest lesson about uh, four years ago by, in the hands of Matthew Waxman teaching me scripting. Essentially identifying the nodes of each of the bricks, identifying the variability of the variable bonds, how that produces a field, how the diagonalization of that produces the possibility of the fold in a flat axonometric. You can see it go from top to bottom. And then finally, what is the maximum rotation you can bring to this in terms of corbeling before it overturns? So you're seeing uh, uh, elevation, side axonometric, uh, section axonometric. and then back to the original representation that we'd done by pencil. And essentially this also maps a kind of conceptual transition from you know, the thumbprint as an image of your thumb uh, to the point at which the index takes over. The index is, a, is, is no longer representational, it's a notational, it's, it's indexical. Uh, and the, uh, the barcode essentially that needs to make that transition in our minds. And design education, historically anyway, has not been conceived that way, something that you're doing here. Very early, uh, they divorced. Uh, the people in Casa de Roca divorced, and so we couldn't build that house. But at the same time, we got this commission to do a, a restaurant in Boston. Uh, the budget was $230,000, I believe. And there were many aspects of it, a bar, a restaurant, a basement, this or that. And we wanted to do this thing called the hookah den, a little lounge that, that um, brought it together. The problem with that, of course, was that when we drew it and gave it to the contractor, he put a budget of 
something like $180,000 for that piece, leaving only about $50,000 for the rest of the restaurant. We were young, this is 20 plus years ago, and we had no idea why would it be so expensive. So essentially we said, okay, let's take this out of the design and we build it ourselves and you do the rest of the restaurant. But then we had to figure it out. And so essentially conceptually we had to do what I'm sure you have done in your mind also. We had to figure out how, what are the metrics of such a thing that these are slats of wood, these are plywood, each of them about uh, two and a half feet. They're an inch high. And the working drawing is, is essentially by pasting the drawing on the ceiling, uh, hanging plumb bobs, and of course coming within a sixteenth inch of tolerance. And we realized after a day we can build one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven rows, which means we can make it in less than a month for $30,000 and still make a profit. There's a $150,000 difference there. And that is a vignette into the politics of construction in the US. If you don't know uh, uh, what it means to build something, effectively you lose all agency over your ability to control the outcome. Uh, and so this story is not, again, the design is, uh, the slats of wood are the brick. Uh, the fold gives structural agency to a surface. Uh, the star shape at the top gives a kind of uh, structural oculus at the top. But most importantly, it developed for us the ability to dialogue very differently with the construction industry. That translated actually into the Tongshen Art Center where the variable bond uh, came to this art center for Jack Tilton. He passed away recently. And essentially, the bonding system became that moment where uh, uh, the skin could breathe, the venting would happen, uh, the HVAC system was, was going to take place. And most importantly, uh, because it's China, it's a structural skin. It is the formwork for concrete. It is not the structure. So, so imagine it's, uh, it, it's that you're building brick up two feet at a time, you're putting rebar in there and you're pouring the concrete and so forth. And it's on the north side is where we reveal the actual structure uh, and also revealing the formwork at the same time. So in effect, the purity of the system is that you're developing a, a masonry membrane as the formwork for the actual structure behind, but then the skin is also performing because it is the membrane through which you get to get uh, sheltered light, you get uh, uh, the air through it, and it's what circulates um, uh, the whole system. So that's sort of the end of the first chapter. The second chapter starts some years later when we essentially had to come to, into confrontation about the difference between a floor and uh, the ceiling or the roof. And uh, you look at all architectures, historic and otherwise, and you realize at the end of the day, you have to stand on the floor, you have to walk on the floor, and yet the roof has another capacity that this building shows in itself. Uh, the capacity to span, the capacity to illuminate, the capacity for the air to go up through it, uh, and St. Peter's, remember, is not a dome. It's actually two domes. And what the dome on the outside represents in the context of the civic agency of the city is different than what it represents on the inside as a kind of uh, representation of the heavens, if you like. But that is not completely the same nor completely different than the idea of the hung ceiling system that we have to deal with today. There are few architectures that are able to conflate the dome and the floor into one surface. And maybe Jussieu was one of those exercises, but it's few and far between. The reality is that these two realms remain fundamentally uh, different from each other. So they, we did a whole series of ceiling structures uh, as part of our early research. Some of them installations, some of them restaurants, and some of them became bona fide projects 
that uh, followed us into the schools of architecture. In the first one for immaterial, ultra-material, we were looking at outside of architecture to come to terms with the problem of geometry. Of course, as you navigate the bosom, the hips, and the butt, you realize that the clothes that you're wearing are essentially the result of either pleats or darts. Um, that was actually in the wrong order, but I will come back to that in a second. The context for all of this, of the double dome, is the fact that today, this is unfortunately the, the shit that we have to deal with. Hung ceiling systems, raised floor systems, um, this is what buildings are, uh, and this is what we house. Mechanical systems, lighting systems, sprinkler, sprinkler systems. And so in the context of that installation, we had imagined in working with this uh, tailoring system, this sartorial system, taking flat sheets and by cutting a piece out, by putting them back together, what you're really doing is making a conical surface. And that conical surface is the is the kind of the 101 of the compound curvature. It's not a compound curvature. It is also a ruled surface. But that slight undulation uh, produces the possibility of non-standard panelization that is coming out of a system. In this case, you can see the way in which uh, the grain of the dart is in tandem with the material. And the grain of the material has is wrestling also with that. So it would break if you went perpendicular to it. So we were quite conscious of that. That research translates further into a robust programmatic effort to bring uh, the program of the restaurant, bank, to free up the floor entirely, hung, hang the structure upside down, the mechanical systems, the wine room, into a, basically a proscenium that on one axis produces the illusion of continuity, while on the other essentially is a series of striations that houses uh, all of the, uh, the bulk and the crap that you see uh, overhead here. Naturally, this is a cladding system. It has no structural function. And so we were constantly searching for ways in which this project may become uh, in dialogue with the broader systems of architecture. In Georgia Tech, I got the opportunity to uh, sit there one year as the Ventulet Chair, and it gave rise to this research about structures. Why is it, I ask you, that we look at structures of history, a vector active structural system on the left, a form active structural system in the middle, or a surface active uh, structural system on the right, and we take for granted that these are different typologies but we've never asked ourselves, how can they topologically fit together? So the question was, are these fundamentally different, or could they come into confluence? We take for granted that water, with a change of state, becomes snow or ice or steam, but we don't ask that of a brick. So when we were working on the installation change of state, we developed a tubular structure and based on the transformation of the x, y, and z vectors, we essentially could compress it and expand it, creating a box beam, a folded beam, and then uh, a vector active beam, but simply by taking the pieces apart. This brick, if you like, this unit of construction, unleashes itself over the length of the entire installation, producing a stacked system here, a laterally braced undulating wall there, a beam here, a truss essentially, and a cantilever here. There's a structural uh, bay here and there's a structural bay here, not connected to that side, but only to that side. And through a transformation of bays, the numerical system, which is 24, that fits into 6 and 4 and 3 and 2, the rotations of this geometry that appears to be chaotic and essentially um, illegible is in reality a system of 24 stacks here that begin to open up into six bays here. Those six bays rotate horizontally to arrive at 
six more bays here before they cantilever out. So this uh, mass of bubbles are each unit rotating one at a time uh, to give structural mass. The interesting thing about this, and you may have met Brandon Clifford. He may have been here. He was a student who had never drawn through Rhino and ended up being the coordinator of this project, built a jig to measure how much the structure was going to slump after we took it out. We had, and in that case, we had not done any um, real structural analysis on this, and it slumped about one inch, what I had imagined would be at least six inches, and it was kind of a miraculous... Uh, Needless to say, this fascination with suspended structures has followed us over the years. And I guess as an icon, this is a very uh, beautiful structure by Siza, particularly because of the way in which the light is able to leak through the edges, essentially a fabric tarp. But once you realize it's concrete and that it has weight to it, it it takes on a may maybe a, a very different kind of presence. Uh, before that, of course, the, the project never built by Khan in Venice was the notion of a suspended structure which is occupiable and programmable. And to me, the, the kind of auditorium on the long axis was always fascinating. All of this in tandem with each other the research of Gaudi with the catenaries as a mechanism to measure optimization once you flip them around. The research of Axel Killian to compute the actions of these things so that you can create variable structural influences without actually having to act uh, to uh, hang chains from them. All of this led to an installation. Uh, that we did for a corporation in their lobby just made out of um, paper clips. In turn, that translated into another research project that we did recently, which really was about how you create a masonry structure in compression. A compressive catenary is what we called it. The idea of that was really to what happens when you hang something in tension? What happens when it's a thick mass? Imagine a ultra-high-strength foam uh, as an inhabitable space, something you can stand on, and essentially looking at the forces upside down of a dome, well, the reality is that that keystone won't really work. It'll, it'll drop out. So you have to develop a lockable system uh, for it to work with each other in order to be able to stand into place. I'm referring, of course, to the Escorial. The Escorial had this imperative of creating a dome that had a floor on top of it. So it didn't have the space of the vault. It was essentially a flat slab that turned into a dome only at, at its edges. What that really means is that the keystone that would normally be in the center is not only there, but displaced there and, there and there and there and there and there and there and only begins to redistribute down as it goes down. So every piece is essentially conical as it goes down because it's really distributing the forces. What happens when you turn that upside down into a suspended system? Well, you have to turn the keystone upside down also, almost like a puzzle piece, so that they interlock with each other and hold each other in place. We did tests, and we realized that a single unit could support over 300 pounds. Then we weighed the entire installation. The entire installation weighed only 300 pounds. So essentially, we knew that we had a structural diagram that could work. And all we needed now was to develop all of these pieces that interlocked based on the catenary that would then be redistributed into all of these seams, Coming from underneath, of course, you see the first impression that you get of it is a smooth handkerchief, a light structure suspended aloft, that only as you come up do you realize that it's made up of different aggregate units, and you begin to witness the weight and the thickness of this uh, as you come around to it, 
the oculus, of course, the keystone is, is therefore displaced into an oculus as it expands out and connects to the tensile moments uh, at the very edges uh, where the entire piece comes together. Interlocked at the seams, uh, of course, you also understand the modeling of this, that if you're going to uh, route this side, you actually need a flatbed on the opposite side against which everything is cut. So one side is rusticated, the other side is smooth, uh, essentially pitting the weight on one side and the lightness on the other side as part of a uh, uh, oppositional diagram. If it's not self-evident that these are directly related for us in our minds, the problem of tectonics, gravity, sensation, and the phenomena of suspension to the two left images, uh, uh, Georgia, State, uh, Georgia Tech on the one hand and uh, Melbourne School of Architecture on the other. I'm not presenting these entire projects. I think it's important to sort of go through relatively fast. But suffice it to say that we inherited this beautiful high bay space, uh, about a story and a half, two stories taller than this space, that was a research space for engineering, among other things for um, helicopter rotaries and things like that in its early years, and to put a school of architecture in there. And to think of that space as an urban space, a public space, uh, as an urban configuration or as a space of the sublime, it has all of those qualities. No, maybe it is not as big as the Tate, but it has the capacity for that imagination. The problem was that this was all in 2007. The budget and the economy were great, and the amount of program they'd asked for us to put in there essentially filled it up, killing the space. And, bop, the economy hit. They lost all their money, and the budget went from, I think, 16 million to 11 million. We lost a third of our budget, which in my mind saved the project because it evacuated the building out of the core and we needed to suspend key elements within that core. And the diagram goes as such. If you have the foundation of the building above you, you can literally suspend everything you're doing from above, freeing up the ground to be uh, flexible as you wish. And for a design school, that needs to function for the Beaux-Arts Ball, for graduation, for film, for large-scale installations. Uh, it is everything to have that flexibility. So imagine in your mind if we moved the lab that's in your basement up to this space, and this space had to function for all of those things. So effectively, uh, and I won't go through all of the details, the gantry crane that was in that space became the new foundation for the the new studio space that connects the third floor studios and the second floor studios. And uh, essentially the ground is completely flexible with desks that move. Uh, the ceiling is the new infrastructure for the studio, for a second means of egress, for the lighting. And the lighting, of course, can go all the way up. Uh, effectively making possible uh, this relationship between the freedom of the ground to speak to the PhD program on one side, the master's program on the other side, the fab lab here, the exhibition there, uh, essentially a building uh, upside down. In Melbourne, we were faced with the predicament of designing a school of architecture with the challenge of designing the studio for the future, the studio of the future, because Melbourne School of Design never had one. They wanted to compete with RMIT. And the one thing they couldn't afford was a studio space. So it was a contradiction of terms. And we realized after we had come up with an atrium scheme that if you turn the corridors the five foot of corridors that you see up there into about nine feet and then use the space beyond that, usurp the space beyond that at every level, at this lower level for exhibition space, at that level for studio space, at another level for crit space, all of a sudden you may get a vertical studio. And so in a, in a way we smuggled a studio into Melbourne 
by taking the horizontal studio and making it vertical and creating a workspace out of that. At the same time, we wanted to develop a, a, a structure whose skylight and dedicated studio space would produce a totemic object that would be in dialogue with this history, but radically different. The Tempietto, as you know, is like a folly. It is a real building, but a miniature building inside of a courtyard in the Gianicolo. And uh, in, in a way, it, uh, the reason it's not comic is that the, you're, you're allowed a peek into the space. Uh, the pictorial space of the door distances from you. You never have an understanding of that scale. Uh, in Kahn's uh, British Museum, the same phenomena of that totem is again an object in the space unrelated to the roof and the benignness of a second means of egress. The stair is concealed by the abstraction of the cylinder. And Gary, in what I think to be one of Gary's best buildings, um, is what he does at his best. The, the, the kind of tension between the abstraction of the frame and the figuration, the zoomorphic uh, figuration of the, the figure in the center. And we wanted to develop a generative system that was at the same time about daylighting, about the structural system, and about a material system that would house the hanging studio. Uh, John Wardle had told me this story about Lawrence coming down for six months to Australia and having a shitty time, the worst time of his life. And it's documented in the book, uh, Upside Down at the Bottom of the Earth. I don't know if you've read this or not. But um, that, but the moment he said that, I said, well, we've sort of done this. Why don't we do it again, but we'll do it in a different way? We'll do a roof system around the atrium that literally suspends the, the dedicated studio. The roof system then is a series of beams with transverse coffering that bring in southern light. Southern light for them is our northern light. And it's a massive piece of timber, LVL, that you can stand in them. They're like eight, uh, nine feet tall. But then from there, there are massive pieces of timber that suspend down and never touch the ground with the timber getting thinner and thinner as it's pulled into tension. It's a reverse tectonics. Uh, the rustication that you would normally have the gr on the ground is up in the air, and everything is held in tension. Everything, of course, is then... What's interesting about Australia is also their predisposition towards prefabrication and off-site construction. So 80% of that building is built off-site, including the scoffering. That's brought in on-site at 4 or 5 in the morning, installed in less than two weeks... Uh, as a result of having been developed, essentially built off-site once in its entirety, to be reassembled on-site to produce this uh, very tense uh, and uh, dramatic uh, moment of levity that I can only describe uh, in terms of the sublime. Uh, and here I'm not playing the role of the critic, I'm playing the, the role of the audience, that... It's one of those moments where you surprise yourself uh, that architecture isn't what you draw. It's, it's something you sense. That there is a phenomenal moment. But it has to do, in my mind, with the translation of mass and weight at the top and the thinness of that fringe at the bottom. It literally becomes a veneer of wood when it gets to the bottom. So the, the kind of the heave, the emphasis at the top buckles the roof uh, while becoming a thin veneer of cladding and acoustic baffles at the bottom for the conference space below. As a sidebar, this is another one of those buildings that was intended to be built entirely of wood. So cross-laminated timber in combination with rebar and concrete would become the formwork for the structure itself and remain in place and essentially become the basis for these terraces that describes these stacked corridors that gain the depth as they go into the structure. The, the base floor 
are these rooms that become exhibition rooms with these suspended panels that rotate for crits. On top of that, the large conference tables outside the studio space for model making and meetings. On top of that, a kind of a table that goes all the way around for drafting, and then on top of that, uh, casual crit rooms. And then stacking on top of that is the undergraduate program, the master's program, the PhD program. So essentially, the entire school is in dialogue with each other on the vertical axis. And oddly enough, because they don't have dedicated studio space, the atrium is always packed and, and quite vibrant. I'm going too much into some of the other computational jig systems that we had to go through, uh, but I'll, I'll move on to another installation that is part of our project of suspension. Uh, and this one is quite different, and it's just an anecdotal story that is sweet, because uh, we do a lot of collaborations. And so I've, I've worked with Adam Silverman, who is a uh, ceramicist on an installation for the Nasher, for instance. This one uh, I did with a, a fashion designer from Pratt. She's from... Um, from uh, uh, Jordan but lives in the United States and the idea was to develop something for uh, the Syrian immigration camps and the idea was to weave these tubular structures that have a structural integrity of their own in suspension that would uh, otherwise become unrolled to become blank blankets for the for the uh, uh, for the uh, refugees. And essentially, the, the story is that, is that a lot of these projects find their ways into smuggling into other programs as a kind of a foil for what we really want to do. The Daniels building, then, uh, is not part of that uh, project of suspension, but takes the catalytic aspect of structural agency to transform a certain aspect of the building that is central to our project. In the context of the Daniels building, half of it uh, is existing, so it's a, re a re renovation and preservation project, and the plugging in of a new building in the back, which is a box, a dumb box. But in fact, if you know and understand the site, I'm not going to go too far into it, it's really a landscape, and the idea is... A, about how to integrate that landscape into the double height space of the Fab Lab, how to integrate a lateral street that goes into there, integrating it with the undergraduate program, folding the graduate program down to bring uh, light down into the core of the building, and finally folding the ceiling to get the best quality of light at the top. Um, much of this building is dedicated to the roof, but the roof is one laminar system amongst four others that are about the manipulation of surfaces that have either structural illumination or hydrological properties. In the case of the roof, the idea was to stop the generic system of the columnar uh, grid to do a long span structure. And so we had two pylons, basically 100 feet apart from that side of the building to this, cantilevered at the center. But had that been a scissor truss, the overturning moment would be so much that you would have to have huge masses of foundation. So somewhat like the for first and fourth bridge, we cantilevered less, essentially dropping a keystone in the center, which would lighten the loads. This takes a long time to get through, but essentially the narrative of this animation has a lot to do with <coughs> a commitment to not complying with uh, sustainable strategies that achieve lead rating, but actually something much more. In other words, engaging uh, the student and faculty research uh, about ecological strategies, about their landscape strategies to a much higher degree and getting them involved in uh, the insertions within the building, much like you've done here. So a lot of it has to do with uh, the energy that is used in the overall building. Much of it has to do with recalibrating the way in which people come into campus by foot, by the tramway, by bicycles, but also going into the micro section of the building and beginning to understand how the concrete system or the laminar systems, as it turned out, 
end up working for natural ventilation, how you get uh, essentially um, displacement ventilation to make things more efficient and remove pollutants, how artificial lighting would work when needed, but not when it's not needed, and how to create a figure, a structural figure, that really essentially is dedicated to the lightening of the structure, the spanning of a great space, bringing natural daylighting in there, and then getting the water out to come down on its edges in a reveal space that then irrigates the landscape around it. That is the representation, if you like, that we delivered to the school before they told us it was unbuildable. Um, and this is not uncommon because that is a common reaction of any contractor in North America. Everything's unbuildable. But as I told you before, this is also, like some of the other projects, just a ruled surface. So we know it is buildable. And we had imagined, uh, because it is a concrete building, that we would actually build it up out of concrete surfaces and span towards the middle. Uh, you're looking at Candela right now. Uh, but in fact, you know, the, the whole prospect of building an entire building in the formwork and then casting it is, is, a, is a difficult thing. But they didn't want to do that anyway. So there was, they said it was completely unbuildable. We drew it for them and we broke it down. And we sent them a model. They said it's unbuildable. So on one of my trips to Melbourne, I called the office from the airport and I said, okay, they say it's unbuildable. Let's build in our, in our workshop. And so we broke it down into light gauge steel. Uh, we established the fact that each of the studs are obviously linear and that the lateral holes within the studs are linear and that you can use just chipboard. In fact, not just chipboard. We found a product that's a radiant panel so that you can absorb the heating and the cooling system right within uh, the ceiling, actually cooling system, because already the floor slab had the heating system in it, and the heat rises. What you really want is the, the, the cool slab above you. So it was all integrated, and the, mo the, the, the notion was that this could actually save you $700,000, and it did. So there was no way out of it for them, a and eventually... Uh, that entire system was translated into steel. And it, re re it recalibrated in our mind the potential of what it means to make a surface and what it means to reveal the structure. There was a version of this scheme where we surfaced only the main hall but then let the steel exposed on all the edges so that the laminar systems became part of its expression also, which they didn't accept because we had to go back and eliminate what was already there. But... Part of the system also was about the efficiencies of the existing slabs. In order to get flat ceilings on the bottom and at the top, essentially to optimize that structure, we used uh, recycled you know, plastics, basically, of uh, used canoes to go into a coffered system that is embedded within uh, the concrete mass of the building. The structural system then is really um, molecularized. It's... Uh, uh, broken down into uh, straight systems that are ruled, plastered over, and then subsequently finished. Going back to where we started from, but in a tectonic system that is non-structural, but is the, is the result of a, a building up of the laminar system towards a profile of the building that is very much an index of how the performance of the building works. This is where the building is at right now, almost complete. We're getting to the end, so thank you for your patience. If all of the projects that I've shown in great part are dedicated to the bottom-up makeup of a unit, whether it's a brick, a panel of wood, or a structural bay, uh, when we were asked to participate in the Guangzhou Biennale some years ago, we had developed this elaborate tensegrity structure uh, with working drawings this thick that we delivered to them a week before they had asked for it, and they loved it. And they said, um, 
that's great. We want to build it. But do you mind if we turn all of the tensile elements into compressive posts? <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and we had had some uh, experience in Korea prior to that. Uh, and so we, we were not innocent of, of what might happen. And we said, we don't mind, but do you mind if we have the drawings back for one week and we redesign it in accordance with only compressive elements? So we worked with a door manufacturer and took recycled uh, door handles, you know, the, the, the kind of door handles that you see on, on some of the front doors of your buildings. And we took all of those door handles to, to make uh, compressive elements. And the diagram conceptually was that there isn't a customized way in which we would suspend the structure. It was a map of density because a column has certain compressive loads on this axis. At the column capital, it needs to redistribute those loads as it goes out, much like a mushroom column. And the roof actually needs to be exactly the opposite. It needs to lighten up as long as it's triangulated to give lateral stability. So effectively, we, we ran an algorithm that would give the right density, but we gave them a formwork within which they could do whatever they wanted. So none of those sticks belongs where we've drawn it. It's a diagram of density. So effectively, it was about the development of an in intricate system of density that would navigate... The infrastructure of the ground, there was a subway system underneath there, so there's only certain pods that you could uh, uh, run into the ground. But also there were trees above, so we had to develop three oculi, one visual, the other one for two trees to go into, within which this single figure would operate and essentially make uh, the corner of the old city. And this is one of those projects where you know, we didn't, we weren't even on the construction side. This was something completely remote and turned out better than we had ever imagined it could be. But it, essentially, it's one of those biennale where the pavilion is permanent and, and part of it. But in a way, the, the, the swarm-like chaotic nature of its tectonics runs completely counter to all of the constructions that we'd done prior. I want to end with this building because it's a, a, a very dear building to me, and at the same time, for you, it's very conventional because you work in concrete. But for us, we almost never work in concrete in, in the United States. So when getting this commission to do a house in southern France, for the first time, we got a taste of what it means to work with a tectonic that is essentially liquid and that you're not working with elements. So we couldn't play our usual games. Our... Uh, our in a way, our intellectual project was irrelevant here because you're, you're essentially pouring liquid and through the admixtures and the cement, the expression of the thing after curing is the result of the formwork or uh, after sort of post-construction chiseling and so forth. And you've seen Paul Rudolph's work and you've seen a great uh, amount of work of um, the Corbusier, among others. And this is a project that's very much situated in the landscape and essentially, we wanted the house to effectively go away, to become part of the agriculture of, this, of the existing landscape. In looking at the site, uh, we took the distortion of the site as a way of distorting a courtyard house to maximize the views towards the Mediterranean, but also use the uphill site to look at um, the trees above. It's not a flat site. It's actually a tilted site. And that was an opportunity to give both levels a view, both the living room level as well as the bedroom levels, nesting a courtyard and a pool in between, but then using the opportunity of the roof to open views towards the west while creating a knuckle at the corners that connects it structurally while extending the landscape all the way through under the building, up to the pool, through the living room, and up the, uh, up the landscape to the top. The front facade that you're looking at is not a facade. It's actually a beam. Um, because, in fact, the swimming pool wall that is here runs up and perpendicularly intercepts a beam that is cantilevered out here, which is further supported by a stair that cantilevers out this way. 
So it's really a structural mass basically suspended in a T formation like this. And we're wondering what does it mean to work in concrete? And this is a part of our research process. We realize there's possibly two modalities within which concrete may function. First is the idea that we're working in a, in a, in a digital environment where many kinds of very easy ways to digitally route form work may give many impressions. And one of the tests that we did was how to produce out of this smooth beam a rusticated wall that is in conversation with the uh, stone walls of the landscape. And the stone walls of southern France are quite beautiful. And so we ran a script. Oops, excuse me. Before I go inside, let me go. Before I go outside, let me go inside. The concept of the house is no different than a case study house. It's an extrusion of glass. And just when you think it's spanning the short axis, it's, in fact, it's vaulting the long axis, opening up those views towards the, the west. And so the, the structural capacity of this house is to establish very smooth concrete surfaces on the inside, but in dialogue with the stone walls of the outside, which is the two modalities that I'm referring to. Uh, the landscape, of course, is, uh, is a great part of this. And of course, as you may have played around with concrete yourselves, the capacity of working with different ways of creating formwork that become the expression uh, of the building. In this, in this case, historic work from Fizak to some of the present uh, colleagues we have with fabric form work, in our mind became the excuse to develop a, a uh, pixelated fabric formed work that would work with nerves essentially, placing different kinds of calibrations to go from a smooth surface to a rusticated surface as it enters the building knowing fully that this is a representational system. It is not doing anything else. It is a visual system. It's a pictorial system. The other modality was to work with the aggregate structure of the concrete and really work with the inner core of its constitution. We wanted it to be smooth on the inside for the finishes, for the artwork, and then go into panel systems where the aggregate gets larger and larger and larger as it goes into the landscape to essentially become all stone and just a little bit of mortar by the time it goes into the landscape. In this case, the kind of gradient transformation that it, that it takes to go from concrete to stone is part of its visual ruse, but in this case, it is a structural retaining wall that's going from a house to the landscape. I think this is where I end. And it ends with a discovery that I made some 30 years ago when I first went to, to Rome, not understanding why cobblestones uh, are laid out the way they are. And even to this day, they're laid out in the same way, but not for the same reasons. I didn't understand that there's a direct indexical relationship between the vaulting of the stone on the ground and the human body in their capacity to put knees on the ground and begin to stretch as, they, as each rainbow essentially becomes a module of construction and as a kind of map of the human body. Imagine that for over 2,000 years, even when you're tagging the subway systems and trains, graffiti too is an index of that body. Your capacity to cantilever your body on the side of a building to, to, to make expression. What is interesting right now, obviously, is the digital revolution has this capacity to do a couple of things. One, it erases the seam of the brick or the module, that there is this capacity to print beyond the realm of the four by eight sheets or the, or the unit of construction. But the other prospect, of course, is that you now have the capacity to program performance within the depth of the cellular printout. So questions of thermal barriers, vapor barriers, waterproofing, insulation, all of those uh, uh, are on the verge of becoming printable. And so for me, 
this is the most exciting moment because it, it is the very mechanism by which everything I've presented to you today may be become overturned. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you, Nader. Uh, for your presentation and uh, I think it's for me one would always say well all we want to hear is that digital fabrication is the driver of everything but to me what was really nice is to see actually that the curiosity is the driver um, for our investigations and I think it's really a great display of how your investigations then lead to the um, completed projects. I'm tempted to say there might not be any questions because you explained it so well, <laughs> but I would nevertheless like to open it up uh, to you um, for, for questions to Nader. Hi. Thank you very much for the pretty brilliant lecture. I think uh, it's, it's very interesting work, but the way you 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 went through it yeah, and, and, and made this point was, was extremely interesting. One thing that I, I am particularly interested in and it came a few times through your argument is this moment when you have uh, or are obliged to solve something because otherwise it will not happen. Yeah. You know? There you become inventive and uh, and but out of scarcity or out of uh, it's sort of an almost existential problem, you know, because you have a vision, you have an idea, and you have no solution. Or let's say the world doesn't offer you any easy way out, and then you start to uh, do it yourself or to engage with things that normally you would not, or nobody asks you to engage, or nobody expects you to engage, and for sure you were not educated. Yeah. to engage and uh, we also experience this as a as, as a very intense moment in the project you know uh, and the point I would like to make is in now in respect to digital fabrication that uh, is a very uh, I mean broad area uh, uh, anyway but there is this point when almost ideologically, and this for me it's the 3D printer as a sort of uh, populist tool that solves everything, you know, mm. suddenly brings into the discussion uh, the possibility to do, to do whatever you want, you yeah. know, yeah. for free, you know. Yeah. And then I, from on, on one side, I feel, yeah, it's interesting, you know, because... Uh, solves a lot of problems, brings a lot of uh, opportunities. And the other side, I feel a bit uh, strange because I, at this point, I would lose this moment of friction of desperate, you know, <laughs> need to solve something. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I'm not talking about 3D printing as a real technology because 3D printing, if you look into it, is extremely interesting, mm. has all the challenges, and in fact, is not what it's sold, you know, yeah. in, in the, in the yeah. popular narrative of, uh, yeah. you know, uh, 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 3D. So there is this vision of digital fabrication that, for me, at a certain point, turns in, into dystopia for architects. Mm. You know, because what are you doing then? Yeah. <laughs> no. What is your point there? How, how do you see this? I look. I I think your commentary and the question that goes with it is one of the most profound uh, uh, statements that that. I, I've heard and that I've had to ponder because, y you know, when anything becomes possible, then you, you're witnessing a discipline on the verge of collapse because at the end nothing matters. I, I would simply say that if I've tried to present anything uh, in this lecture, it has to do with the narratives, the, the disciplinary narratives that produce the very constraints that are the frictions that drive things forward. Um, I don't need mass industrialized products to produce that friction for me. Uh, 
even the 3D printer will have its own agency to produce the framework within which certain uh, inventions and limits are construed. And anybody who has had to go through them understands that uh, there's always a limit, but the limits become newly defined. At the same time, I'm completely aware that through the internet, through rapid communication, and through rapid production, uh, in a strange way, architecture has become uh, an extension of popular culture. Anybody who says that architecture is ir irrelevant now is wrong, actually, because it's, it's on every website, it's everything, and anything that has a strong image uh, has the capacity to, to trump great architecture, which is why it's so difficult to you know, surf the net and go through Design and Arc Daily and all of that, because a lot of the things that you see at least at first sight, are spectacular. But it takes either a closer look or a real visit to understand what are those moments where uh, architecture is the result of systemic and integrative thinking. To the extent that I would argue for the greatest moments of what we're after is are those moments where unsuspecting conditions come out of integrative moments. And when I talk about integrative moments, I'm not speaking about the kind of holistic aspects of Piano and Rogers and Foster, where everything is under the regime of a centralized order. It is the capacity of an architecture to become informal, to become customized, or to become bespoke but for reasons that are significant, while also understanding uh, the larger adherence of part-to-whole relationships. And that part-to-whole relationship may be construed as a, um, a mandate for optimization and, and buildability, or it may be a mandate for disciplinar disciplinary consistency. At the end of the day, I think there are actually very few architects left. I, I look out there on the horizons and I, I'm in awe by many practices, but very few of them have the patience to get into the thick of the systems that are the precondition for the spectacle. And, and I think this is maybe the side of my response which may be pathetically antiquated and old-fashioned. But I think the bar was just raised. It's just more difficult to, to lay a claim to, to architecturality because so much is possible. So I may not have the right answer for you, but I, I like to think that uh, because anybody can gain access to software, because anybody can Photoshop anything, because anybody can build that reality, uh, something that's happening within the discipl uh, discipline is not about uh, the figure. It's all about the configurative systems that are the precondition for an architecture that is yet to be. And to that end, if I take you back to the, the bowl and the nest, uh, some of the most interesting as aspects of developing generative systems are their capacity to be adaptable to very different phenomena and different conditions. Uh, but it's very difficult to invent a system, actually. Hence my interest in, in your work also. I mean, the work of your lab, the work of the students, and, and, and everything that's happening in this environment. Thanks. Are there more questions? Thanks very much, Nedo. Fantastic lecture. Um, Apart from this kind of triumph over adversity and the, the launching of the project in many cases from huge challenges, I think another element which is consistent and, and extremely strong in your work uh, as compar compared to others is the what you just called an integrative moment, but which is some form of negotiation of each element having multiple roles. Yeah. And that in very often it involves structure, but it also involves daylighting, involves 
spatial uh, creation and so forth. To what extent, and it will be the answer is probably all of the above, but to what extent is that a conscious or an unconscious distancing yourself from a modernist predecessors? Or to what extent is that a straight pragmatist dealing with trying to get things to happen and that by overlapping systems then they can't be thrown out? Or mm. it, what is the what are the many drivers probably of this mm. extreme move towards negotiation of multiple systems in, all, in many of the elements of your work? Uh, everybody knows the term value engineering, which is a kind of euphemism for getting rid of design. Um, if, if this building had had a steel structure with wood cladding, there would not be the need for the wood. If you can make the beams out of wood and it's a naturally, naturally renewable resource, there is a narrative in there. So, and, and this may sound cynical, but it's not actually. I'm saying that the story that architecture tells is a very important one. The actuality of what it becomes is the second order of imperative. To the degree that you can uh, hit all of those narratives, that something is the result of the intersection of three or four narratives, uh, produces uh, the cloud of inevitability. Uh, so yes, when, when this becomes the structure, if you, if you don't have a structure, you don't have a roof. And insofar as you can make uh, you know, that LVL standard, there's no veneers on that LVL. That is just what you're looking at. The only, there is actually, I, mean, I should say that that's raw LVL everywhere you're looking at. But the veneer that you see going up here, the ash, is on the bottom side of that. So there is a direct tectonic relationship with the finish of the underbelly that comes down, that eventually becomes the veneer here. But all of that is raw. And the eye is motivated to see them as monolithic. But there's a moment, I think, and this is a political strategy I'm talking about, the moment that the client or the user groups or the facilities people can lay claim to the narrative, then it's their project. It's no longer your project. So I think there's many elements to your question. There's a political motivation. There is the story, the narrative. And then there's the actuality. I mean, look, if the LVLs had been double the price of steel and uh, if the structural system didn't actually work and it didn't suspend, uh, you would have a lot to answer. So you are... The, 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 the problem of ethics and accountability is real, uh, but it also has to do with where you decide to spend your money. Melbourne is the result of not $300 a square foot. It's the result of $350 a square foot on the center, so you can be $175 a square foot on the outside. So you get, to, you get to decide that. They can't tell you that because you, you don't spend equal money everywhere. In the context of, of this building, um, uh, the structure did work. But you know, it, you can't build it without steel. You know why? Not because it can't stand up. Because fire codes require that there's a uh, backup system in case it does. So, so just when you think you've resolved everything, there is, you know, one strap of steel that comes this way and this way, another one that comes this way and this way, and they hold up these decks. They're very light, but they're enough to hold it in tension. It's a belt and suspender scheme. So I'm saying it's, uh, it's also not a narrative about truth or purported truth. N it, there's many complexities and contradictions to all of these narratives. So we're, we're not innocent of that either. But it, it, it knows basically that the bottom line is such a severe uh, threat, a guillotine that is over our necks, that if you don't take that seriously, uh, you become obsolete or your voice becomes obsolete. So to become relevant, you have to actually engage in the economics and the politics of the project on the one hand, 
But if you abdicate the role of design to somebody else, then either the engineer owns it, or the mechanical engineer owns it, or the, even worse, the client owns it. So in my mind, the, the, the agency of design deliberation is really at the core uh, of this argument. And the only way we've been able to uh, have a presence in that warfare is to develop the narrative that is um, multi-layered. So it's actual and rhetorical is what I'm saying. I have maybe less of a question, but more a comment. Thank you very much for the really brilliant lecture. And I think um, the topics that you address with aggregations and tectonics, especially in your diagram where you showed the, the nest and the mm. what's and somehow you find also ways of uh, finding ways in between. And that's also very relevant for, for I think, future architecture where we, where we start to maybe define material on another scale. And especially when you're in the project where you uh, what we see here, where, where it's about the distance between the bricks, where the mortar becomes the medium or the, mm. the carrier of information, and that I think is uh, not only tectonic but also very poetic. Now, seeing the the recent um, uh, 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 the designs of the uh, Danish faculty, I'm, of course uh, I really want to see it in real. I have a question to you: How do you, uh, how what is your strategy for teaching architecture or teaching the values that we see here in your lectures? and uh, the vision of a future architecture school, because we see here also many projects that are... In the uh, context of the schools of architecture, uh, Thomas Cavan, who was the dean at Melbourne, I think put it most uh, directly and concisely. Uh, he said, invariably, you need a pedagogical building. A pedagogical building is not only a building within which learning and teaching occurs. It's the fact that by its very presence, the building, in all its success and in all of its failures, becomes a didactic instrument. You can't be in this building and not ask yourself, how is this roof working? Uh, and the discovery and challenging of this very roof becomes the, the mechanism of education for a student. In that sense, all of these projects, schools of architecture or not, are testing the limits of perceived reality versus actual reality. They're provoking you to read into them or they're provoking you to engage in an architecture which at its core is defamiliarizing the conventional. So the concept of def defamiliarization is sort of embedded in, in, in that process. Um, But the actual teaching that I do in school is, is much more difficult because teaching is, is one of the hardest things to do because you can't tell somebody, do this, because you're supposed to ask them, why do you do this? Or why should I do this? And so for a student to discover the why uh, is very difficult. And so it requires a patience to understand that anything that you look at that appears to be resolved is the result of multiple questions which are not unilateral or from one direction. So a, a building may be the result of an urban flow, but that may not describe its material constitution. Uh, the answering of its material constitution from a configurative point of view will not aptly describe its spatial layout or its typological pre predispositions. So at the end, what is interesting about architecture in my mind and teaching it is that the project of foundations, what you do in the first few years of architecture, is its ability to discursively broaden discussions in, in very polarized and multilateral ways the net result of which uh, is, is discursive. And so uh, for me, beyond the actual building serving as the vessel for something very specific, the space of learning uh, is really about inserting yourself in the long durée of certain debates that may go back to Zemper and beyond, 
or may go to the finite and very specific debate that, let's say, you know, Zaira Polo wrote about last week in this article. So I, I think um, you have to enjoy that if you want to participate in this, in this forum anyway. So th it's implicit, actually, in the talk also, is that there is also a positioning of where we stand in relationship to the longer arc and the specific arc that we're all up against right now. Nada Tarani, I think enjoyment is a very nice word to, to end with. I think we greatly enjoyed your lecture and we will enjoy thinking architecture, thinking through architecture even more after your lecture. So thank you for thank the you. marathon, <laughs> for the intellectual <laughs> rigor you displayed throughout the day. Thank you for coming to Zurich. Thank Zoom. you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah.